Hello, everybody, and welcome to the University of Sydney Library's panel discussion to celebrate National Reconciliation Week 2022. This year, the Reconciliation Week theme is Be Brave and Make Change. And this, of course, is a challenge to all Australians to be brave and tackle the unfinished business of reconciliation so that we can make change to the benefit of all. To celebrate National Reconciliation Week, our discussion today will explore the changes that we're making to embed culturally competent practice in the management of the library's cultural collections. I'm Antonia Makata. I'm the Director of Central Services at the University of Sydney Library, and I'll be your MC and host today. I'm also joined by a panel of expert colleagues from the Library's Access Services Division, and they'll be sharing insights into our development of approaches to improve culturally competent practice in the management of cultural collections at the University of Sydney Library. They are Lisa McIntosh, Director of Access Services, Alicia Rogers, Collections Management Coordinator, and Ryan Stoker, who is the Digital Collections Librarian. Before we begin proceedings, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm today on unceded Gadigal country. I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. And as we share our own knowledge, teaching, learning and research practices, may we also pay respect to knowledge is embedded forever within the Aboriginal custodianship of country. I also acknowledge the peoples of the lands that you're on today and pay my respects to their elders past, present and future. Now, as mentioned, today's session will take the form of a panel discussion in which I'll field a series of questions to our experts. There'll also be time for audience questions at the end, and please do add these via the Q&A function in Zoom uh, rather than the chat. Don't put them into the chat because the questions will be lost there. Please do use the Q&A function. However, throughout the presentation, you're also welcome to share your thoughts via the chat function. And that might include adding the names of the traditional lands you're on today. And I see that some people are doing that already. Thank you. Should anyone wish to use them, auto-generated closed captions are also available for this event and they can be accessed by the CC button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Once you've clicked that, then either click show subtitle or view full transcript. I should also mention that the session is being recorded, but only the panelists' voices and faces will appear in the recording. To start with, I'd like to provide some context for the collections related work that will be discussed today. And this forms part of a wider program to implement the into practice the University of Sydney Library's Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultural protocols that were published in 2021. The library's cultural competence journey actually started back in 2017. And the National Centre for Cultural Competence that's embedded within the Office of the Deputy Vice Chancellor Indigenous Strategy and Services at the university commenced its cultural competence leadership program that year. And this is an immersive cultural learning experience on country with a focus on knowing, learning about Aboriginal history, culture and custom, being, being aware, authentic and open, and doing or acting in culturally appropriate and respectful ways. Colleagues from across the library have attended this learning opportunity, including the entire library senior leadership team. And this inspirational program has resulted in library-wide support for cultural competence initiatives at a senior level. The most recent university and library strategies have also had a really strong focus on culture, diversity and inclusion, including in the area of cultural competence. And it's been a strategic priority to make the library a culturally safe, res a, a respectful, welcoming and supportive space for all members of our community, including the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples within the, within the university. In 2018, we commenced the development of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultural protocols for the library to articulate our commitment to enhancing and embedding cultural best practice across the library's collections services and spaces, and also, of course, to document actionable library-specific steps for realizing our strategic intent. To develop the protocols, the library engaged an expert in cultural collections, Wiradjuri man Nathan Sentence. And the process involved thorough consultation with library stakeholders, and in particular, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander members of the university community. The protocols were published in 2021, and the library has since embarked on their implementation. And this is a huge body of work comprising 24 projects over a four year period. And they touch on all areas of library operations. 
To signal the library's commitment to this work and to demonstrate value to the university, the entire implementation program has been aligned with the university's One Sydney Many People Indigenous strategy. Now, the protocol's implementation work is being approached in a really holistic way across the entire library and managed via a program steering committee. And given that the implementation involves improving culturally competent practice across all library operations, it includes work to improve services and spaces. And of course, a significant portion of what's being done centers on library collections and their management. And this is the focus of our discussion today. So we'll now hear from our expert panel on the collections related work that's being done to embed the protocols and what they've learned during that process. So starting with my first question to Lisa and Ryan, and I might throw to you first, Lisa, what does it mean to have culturally safe collections and where do you start? Thanks, Antonia, and, and hi, everyone. So uh, where our aim would be that our collections are, are all culturally competent by, you know, they provide an ethical and diverse representations of knowledge and perspectives. You know, cultural safety for collections is, is different. It's, it's the mechanisms whereby individuals, processes and our systems can provide context and awareness respecting and supporting engagement with collections and specific requirements for materials in advance during or after their use. And where do you start? Well, where we started is with the people. We started with the people and the strategy. So providing cultural competence training and awareness from the top down and then throughout the whole library, developing a local community practice. Um, we started consultation and partnerships a good two years before we started implementing any changes to our services, spaces and collections. Um, and I think that's something really uh, important to sort of take on. They'd like to take the time to really sort of understand what this is and, and, and sort of develop it from a, a people in a, a cultural perspective before you start changing what you, what you do. I think that's so important to emphasize, Lisa, that, that, that uh, we took a people first approach and to, and, and that's been really uh, supported our success in engaging everybody in the process. Um, Ryan, to you, uh, what does it mean to you to have the uh, culturally safe collections? And given that you've been so deeply involved in the rollout of the protocols and their implementation, where did you start? Oh, thanks, Antonia, and uh, thanks, everyone. And uh, I'd also like to just um, acknowledge country. Um, I'm also calling in from Gadigal Lands today and uh, acknowledge Elders past, present, emerging, and um, and also um, acknowledge Lands and everyone's on today. Thank you for sharing, um, if you've done so in the chat, um, on the Lands which you're on. It's uh, really great to see a wide, um, uh, quite a diverse range of different countries being represented here by, by either people um, in the audience or um, people calling in. Um, so for myself, I guess um, uh, I guess Lisa's done a really great um, introduction to um, what we how we approach that uh, how we approach cultural safety and 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 what that means. So I'll, I guess I'll provide a bit more of a, a personal um, <laughs> viewpoint on that. i um, being Wiradjuri uh, myself, and um, for me, cultural safety in, in collections or culturally safer collections is is very much around I guess two aspects. It's the first is to have um, diverse diversity in our collections, celebrate our mob um, and the research that we do uh, here at the university um, and, and celebrate those viewpoints, um, but also doing that in a respectful way. And um, one thing uh, I guess that I've always had to acknowledge is, um, and, and with my own learning as well, um, is that um, to often realise that libraries aren't um, a neutral space. Like we do try to be um, as neutral as we can, but we do have, um, um, we do have some approaches where we've um, made conscious decisions around restricting content or not doing things right in the past um, um, and, and analysing way and sort of having a view of how we can change that. And um, for, for me, I guess we've um, that we've been doing a lot of work and we've sort of been asking questions um, around around that. So um, as Lisa mentioned, we um, and, and Tony mentioned, we have training around cultural competence and um, that definitely was a, a starting point um, where we then started questioning about how um, our, our collections and, and how safe they were for people to access. Um, and I guess from that, that started those conversations around, okay, well, um, what, 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 what are we actually doing right and, and where can we improve? And 
Um, and I guess that's sort of the fundamental question um, around that is to is to have that cultural understanding first, and then that that moves into cultural safety um, and, and being aware of um, the reasons why um, certain things might be unsafe. So, for instance, um, coming across uh, culturally sensitive items in, a, in an older um, collection of manuscripts, for instance, and, and not having that well catalogued, um, that that may cause distress for some people or, or seeing um, things that might be men's or women's business and, and having a bit more of a better understanding of that um, and, and of those um, sort of approaches and the reason why certain things might be considered restrictive or, or, or traumatic or offensive to people, um, that then starts um, uh, allowing you to then question around how do we, how can we make this then safer for clients? And, and again, it's around the conversations that uh, Lisa also mentioned, reaching out to people, having a chat with them and, and getting um, particularly our mob's viewpoints around um, why certain things might be unsafe or, or where they might find safety. Um, the other thing I guess is important to note is um, with collections, I often take the view that that's um, one aspect to, to culturally safe um, libraries more broadly. Um, and, and not only just includes collections, but then also how those collections are displayed online. Um, so for myself, the background in digital collections, um, we make um, content available online for people to access. Um, and, and we need to also consciously think about how we display that on the library's web pages or in the catalogue um, and, and treating that online space as well as part of that um, uh, that um, as part of the cultural um, safety of collections as well. So I'm often quite concerned around that. And also looking at the um, uh, the uh, back end of our systems as well. So people who are working in the office in cataloging systems or acquisition systems and things like that. And um, not just um, for people who are coming into the library and viewing our collections either on site or online, but also the people who are working behind the scenes um, managing those collections as well. Um, that's also another important thing to, to consider when we're looking at cultural safety. So it's not just talking to people externally, but also talking to people internally around um, what things, um, how people will feel safe in that environment in their day-to-day -day work. Thanks, Ryan. And it's important to highlight, as you have, that a holistic approach needs to be taken. There are so many different aspects to culturally safe collections and to culturally safe libraries more broadly. Um, which leads me to my next question, which is to you, Alicia. How have the cultural protocols influenced or changed the way you approach building and maintaining the collection? Thank you, Antonia. Uh, yes, the whole idea of a holistic approach is really valuable here, especially when it comes to collection maintenance. Um, we have quite a legacy of roles and a connection between collecting and ownership that has really hit its redundancy now. And if we position ourselves as custodians with our capacity to collect and maintain these collections as a service, I think we have a greater opportunity to be brave and make changes in this space. So to start with, um, we're engaging in what we call conscious collecting practices. What this means is that we're establishing our purchasing profiles with our vendors to make sure that we automatically purchase First Nations resources. Uh, we're introducing our vendors to a lot of um, smaller local non-mainstream producers, creators, publishers. Some of our vendors are already um, advocates in the space. For example, James Bennett, they have connections with Trambi and Black Books, which is wonderful to support. Clear Music, they're sourcing music scores from us, um, from First Nations composers, ProQuest even are helping us to address imbalances with our ebook holdings. Now, the initial setup for all of this, it's, um, it's quite an investment, but there's a great ripple effect because we're changing distribution workflows here. We're increasing the visibility of these resources, not just for our users, but for other libraries who engage with these vendors. And therefore, it's a much greater reach. Shared print partnerships is another way. It's another support mechanism that we use. We're part of the Happy Trust Print Retention Project. And this is where we commit to retain resources for 25 years. Now, we are given a list of um, resources that we can select from, and we have prioritised First Nation resources within this list. Now, when most libraries are looking to try to reduce their physical collections and making really difficult decisions about what to retain and how to dedicate space, this is a great opportunity for us to actually make it clear how important these resources are to our publication record. 
So it's a great opportunity for us and we're very fortunate to be able to do this. Uh, there are other small steps we can take, uh, such as shared digitization schemes, arranging external loans. We can really enrich each other's collections, not just within campus, but broader. Uh, we can enrich each other's exhibitions, our records, and we can increase and diversify the reach. And because we share our catalogues with a much larger audience these days, we can really raise awareness with metadata. And I'm so thankful metadata is actually starting to get some awareness about how um, tremendous an impact it can have in this space. Quality metadata, it provides supportive context, it makes our collections more accessible to community, it enables a more empowering engagement and a culturally safe engagement too. Now, uh, there's no arguing that past publication and uh, collection practices have supported and perpetuated quite an imbalance in our collections and we openly acknowledge this in our protocols. We don't hide resources, that's not what we're doing. We are actively enhancing the discovery of these resources because we want to invite conversation. I think experiencing this type of vulnerability is just a very valuable experience and part of our journey. We're very lucky to have a metadata manager who is constantly keeping aware of all the emerging practices. And she's really supporting her staff to make sure that we can continue to support these protocols just now, but into the future. Because we do get requests to have metadata changed with our catalogue records. We do get requests to add or remove terms, change classifications, um, even change shelving location. However, I will say we do need a little bit of compassionate patience in this space. We are trying to avoid adding uncontrolled terms because we want to make sure any changes we do make are sustainable. Um, we might we want to make sustainable commitments to these protocols. So they have to be scalable changes, automated where possible, because this is definitely not a one-off project. The good thing about using controlled vocab and standards means that they already have respect and they're already very well socialized. However, it's quite a significant process with realizing change in this space. And it also takes a while to establish new standards and new metadata. The good news is, However, there is a lot of small steps that all libraries of all sizes can already take. Now, as an example of what we've done, uh, we've implemented a routine workflow for adding Auslang codes to our bib records. We've added and updated the ITSIS subject headings. We also use Markive authority control services to update our headings as well. We are replicating the search strategy that Trove uses for their First Nations icon. So we make sure that our resources are included where appropriate in this set. We also are requesting these enhancements when it comes to our vendor records. Uh, we're making sure that we do this so that we can really efficiently establish filters when we're running collection reports, when we want to make automated discovery opportunities. Uh, at the moment, we're developing a digital exhibition space, and this will be in our instance of Primo, where we'll be able to easily showcase um, new and existing Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander resources. And this will be a lot more sustainable to keep up to date than say the traditional um, physical book display because it's gonna be automated. It's, it means that we can spend other time developing and deepening our implementation of the protocols. Uh, we are also finding ways to work within the limits. Uh, we actively report insensitive metadata but sometimes it takes a while to get this um, seen to. And so we find ways to suppress fields within records rather than suppressing the entire record. To add to this, we also make sure that we do monitor how all this metadata comes into our different discovery platforms, because it's not just in our own space, it's other spaces that our metadata appears and we make sure that it reflects correctly. And our service providers are meeting us on this page. Uh, they're increasing the customizations we can make to our platforms. They're even providing feedback channels dedicated to this. Uh, Ex Libris have an anti-bias email where you can report insensitive um, terms in their knowledge base records. And we're likewise doing the same. We're making sure our stakeholders have a voice so that we can increase the number of critical eyes on our records. We have UX experts who routinely review our feedback channels to make sure that this is welcomed, that you know people can give feedback and it feels intuitive, it feels comfortable, and they don't feel bounced around just because we don't know what to do yet, but rather it's a conversation we're building. 
And I should say that we don't do this alone. We're very fortunate to have lots of partnerships with other libraries. Uh, one I really do want to mention is we have a partnership with Wingara Mura Research Library, which is actually located on campus here. They have a very unique collection, nearly 7,000 items, and all of these are out of print, very rare. You wouldn't find them um, anywhere else. Um, we host their catalog records, but what we get back from them in terms of collection guidance and expertise is amazing. Uh, their collection provides an amazing snapshot of the diversity of topics and the range of considerations that we have to you know, encounter when we're looking at these resources and trying to manage them responsibly. Another piece of collection stewardship is ongoing collection maintenance you know, all that BAU work that we do. And this can have great impact on the long-term of the long-term availability of resources and also the interpretation of these resources. So we're embedding the protocols. And the great thing about embedding in BAU is that it engages staff on all levels. It's just tremendous in that regard. And it also offers so many opportunities for us to connect and to learn with others in this conversation. We have added a lot more consideration since we started this implementation, especially to the criteria, and we've made sure we add new priorities. And we also make sure we're communicating collection maintenance a lot better too. It's been a great side effect. We want to make it clear that it's never just been about making space. Instead, it's you know being aware of small print runs, being aware of the uniqueness of our resources, uh, discovering disciplinary differences, um, reassessing where we physically locate items, even on the shelf. For example, um, when we look at our curriculum collection, we need to consider publication date for, you know, where it is appropriate that we should be endorsing this for um, education students. Recently, um, we also had a project to reallocate multiple copies within this collection. And this was a wonderful opportunity to support other collections. We engaged in a very consultative process because we wanted to make sure that we did this responsibly. And we also wanted this chance to deepen our connections and partnerships across the campus and even broader. So we first offered the resources to Wingara Mura, and then we also contributed to the James Bennett Sustainability Project. Now this supports both the Indigenous Literacy Foundation and Trambi and it allocates resources with cultural safety in mind and where possible back to community. We acknowledge we're not experts, but we can connect to them. And the other benefit of embedding this in our BAU is it means that we're working on manageable sets and routinely, rather than tackling all our collections one hit, which can be incredibly daunting. And there's a greater sense of momentum we build with this, because and that is so important that we have some momentum because that's very empowering for the staff. And lastly, um, just to follow on from something Ryan said previously, we do have a duty of care to our staff that must be considered with this type of work. For example, when we're performing collection maintenance or assessing donations, it's often material that hasn't been pre-screened. There is no metadata attached, no warnings. And so embedding our protocols, we have the chance to make sure that our workplace both physical and virtual as well as all the workflows, the training, supporting documentation, it's, you know, ensuring our cultural safety. And that really means making sure that the staff who are performing this work feel safe and they feel comfortable with the work they're doing. And we're very lucky to have a very supportive library family. There's never been a question about these changes. It's just how we think about collections these days. Thanks so much, Alicia. I really think that that answer encapsulates the complex landscape of managing library collections and how many considerations we need to make when implementing cultural protocols that touch on so many things. Um, looking at a more specific area of collections, Ryan, now to you, you work in digital collections. What's been the impact of digitization in the implementation of the protocols? Um, so definitely for our area, we, um, uh, we we have several collections, I guess, to provide a bit of context around what we do. Um, we work with new items that are created. So we um, have a growing thesis collection um, where a lot of students are 
providing us with um, uh, new items in the catalogue. And a lot of those are um, researchers who have um, collaborated with uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities um, or um, Indigenous themselves, and they're providing their own experiences and um, um, perspectives um, into, into, the, um, into the visas collection. Um, likewise, we also have a repository that looks after research data. Um, and again, we have a lot of great academics um, um, who are either working with communities um, or, uh, or doing Indigenous-led research. Um, we also have a, uh, a, a historical collection of um, thesis items, and we work closely as well with rare books to digitise um, a lot of the library's special collections and, and particularly formed my, um, Full manuscript collections from researchers and um, and other people who have contributed things to when the library was being developed um, back in the back in the past. Um, so we we sort of um, as Alicia mentioned, we sort of sit in this um, uh, sort of a um, world where we've got a, a lot of things that we're looking at um, that have either been um, where research approaches haven't been necessarily. Um, uh, been appropriate working with communities, um, a lot of um, cultural information being taken from communities um, and then written as part of research. And then we have this newer collection, which is people working closely with communities and, and a lot of community-led research there as well. Um, so to talk about our legacy stuff first, um, I think that might be a good um, place to talk about. Um, we've been doing a project around digitising our legacy thesis collections. So these are um, uh, physical um, thesis that uh, are submitted um, prior to 2017, and it goes all the way back until about um, 1930, even further, with some items. Uh, and with that, um, put, uh, implementing these protocols, it's given us um, an opportunity to um, be first and foremost selective with what we digitise. So particularly with a lot of um, the more contemporary um, uh, items to promote those um, in our repository and digitise those and prioritise those um, along with a general um, uh, diversity inclusion approach, um, incorporating other viewpoints into that. Um, and with our um, older items, particularly items that have been created before 1980, um, we've um, been able to incorporate assessments into our, um, uh, into our selection for that. So uh, one thing we want to avoid, of course, is digitising um, any items that may uh, contain culturally sensitive or, or, um, or restricted um, information. So we're talking about um, locations of cultural sites of significance. Um, uh, items talking about uh, particular practices, um, particularly mortuary rites, um, other other rites and ceremonies as well, um, particularly if they were um, restrictive. And uh, with that, um, we've incorporated that as part of our flagging process. So if we do come across something like that, um, we record that and um, and then make an assessment around. Um, what our approach should be. Um, it's important to note that we're not um, making uh, curatorial decisions unless we're 100% certain about that. So if there's an explicit statement from um, the author to say that there's culturally restricted content, um, we would follow that advice there. Um, where there's things that we are a little bit uncertain of, um, of course, we, we sort of err on the side of caution and not digitise that, but we do record that um, to, to follow up um, on further investigation to, um, as part of that, we're, we're sort of um, building our capability around um, consultation reaching out to communities to ask them about um, uh, whether or not it would be appropriate to make this available or, or return it um, or, or just sort of leave it as is and, and how to manage that a bit properly. Um, particularly with digitisation, one of the one of the main issues, and, and Alicia has mentioned that as well, is that you're not sure what you're going to come across in the collection. Um, for our thesis collection, um, we were picking, uh, we picked up, just an example, we picked up a thesis that was talking about dentistry and um, particularly Australian dentistry. And um, when we were going through that, there was a particular chapter that wasn't even recorded in the catalog that contained um, information about um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander um, uh, dentures and, and teeth profiles and, um, and a bit of research around that. And that also included um, historical images of ancestral remains um, in there to provide examples and, and that on plates in, in that thesis. And uh, on the surface, you wouldn't realise that that had that contained in there and um, that that sort of um, prompted us to, to think a bit more critically around that selection. Um, this was prior to, to us implementing the protocols there and that sort of um, that was sort of a bit of a, um, a spark in terms of um, starting off on this journey um, was that we, we sort of um, uh, came to the realisation, particularly with, with my team, came to the realisation that there are things in, in items that are um, on the surface may seem fine, but then when you do dig a bit deeper, um, there might be those kinds of things. And um, 
Uh, another example of that with our more broader digitization program, we were um, working on a particular collection that was focusing on um, a socialist colony over in um, South America, in Paraguay. And again, on that, when we were going across that, um, coming across that item and starting to digitize those, and, and we were doing our reviews, we came across a language list for um, um, for a country up um, northern New South Wales and southern Queensland. And um, we weren't expecting that at all. That wasn't in our finding aids or in the, in the metadata or the catalogue. So you do come across these unexpected discoveries, and it's important that we sort of incorporate that as part of our um, process for digitization to say, you might, may expect to come across these things and we need to um, note these and, and record these. And I know, Ryan, that um, because of some of that work that you've been doing in digitization and where you've encountered um, some unexpected content and particularly culturally sensitive content, that uh, we decided to initiate a pilot uh, for the survey of the collection, which will be rolled out more broadly later. But can you talk a bit about how you'd undertake a survey for cultural heritage materials and what challenges and insights are involved. Yep. All right. So, um, so for our approach, um, and that, that was sort of involved, um, informed by the, the um, few examples that I mentioned there, um, we started off, and one of the things that was in the protocols implementation was that um, um, one of the first um, things that we should be doing is undertaking a survey of collections. And um, because of those discoveries that we found in our digitization, we decided to focus on the thesis collection first. And um, so with the first question around um, how you would start with a survey is to either focus on a collection. Um, it might also be a particular country um, as well, but for us, since we have um, a wide representation um, of different um, uh, different items that cover everything from the East Coast of Australia all the way to the West Coast, we, we decided to have that bit more of a broader approach to it. Um, one, one of our main goals was to, um, as you mentioned, Antonio, to um, identify culturally sensitive content. Um, we also expanded that out um, based on um, consultation with colleagues and um, also speaking with our uh, wonderful staff up at the Mingara Muru Research Library. Um, we decided to expand that as well to cover um, offensive content. So um, if um, an item was using outdated terminology or, um, or, or the um, author was making statements or um, having a research focus that was um, um, uh, a bit of a negative light on, on First Nations people or, um, or addressing questions in, in that negative light, um, but also covering um, traumatic events. So things like um, colonial violence, um, uh, items talking about um, stolen generations or, um, um, or life on missions or all the conditions on missions and reserves. Um, so things like that that may um, that may bring up um, some sort of traumatic memories for people because a lot of that is um, still fairly recent um, as well. Um, we also didn't want to make it a deficit survey. So we also had as a criteria to um, also uh, identify and note um, any Indigenous cultural and intellectual property. So if there were things like language lists, um, family histories or um, um, or other um, uh, items that we're talking about, um, either cultural practices that make be sensitive or not, um, or um, perspectives from from Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. Um, we also wanted to include that in the survey as well, because um, that would be an opportunity then to highlight those um, items that may not necessarily be discoverable in our collection, and and go out to communities and and mention and and have conversations with them about that to say, um, we found these things in our collection. What would you like us to do with that? Um, so when we had that, we decided to um, go through our repository. Um, so we focused on digitized and um, digital thesis items. And we uh, uh, basically did a, um, a trawl through the, the catalog for that, um, exported out a, um, a list of catalog records um, in our repository and, um, uh, and, and then begin um, the process of sort of uh, filtering that down. Um, one thing is that we did a very broad search strategy on that. So anything, um, so we used um, keywords such as Aboriginal, Torres Strait Islander and Indigenous um, to build that list. And we tried to keep that quite broad, um, mainly because um, uh, one thing with our um, repository is that um, there is uncontrolled metadata in there, particularly with subject terms. Um, people can create subject terms for um, newer items or um, keywords for newer items, but then we um, also have some control vocabulary there as well. It's a bit of a mix. Um, the other reason was also for um, the fact that we have um, 
optical character recognition for a lot of our digitized items. Um, and it was uh, also just that having that approach just to allow, give us the opportunity to also um, locate, um, as I mentioned with that dentistry thesis, if there was only a chapter or a section talking about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander um, uh, topics or um, perspectives um, that may not necessarily be captured in, in the abstract of the thesis. Um, so from there, we um, then decided to do a bit more of a deep dive and we focused on items prior to 1980 and that was based on advice again um, from colleagues, um, but also um, uh, a recommendation from um, uh, curriculum assessment tools. So the Queensland Education Authority has a really great, um, um, although now a little bit dated guide around um, um, around what to, um, how to make assessments around um, uh, items to add to, to classes and things like that. And one, one of the recommendations was to focus on things prior to 1980, um, as they may be higher risk in terms of um, culturally sensitive items. Um, so we did a bit more of a deep dive and, and had a look in terms of um, the criteria around that. So um, I mentioned a few things before in the protocols on that. Um, and then we uh, started to make assessments around, um, around that. So again, um, looking at possible recommendations, um, either to follow up with um, a reference group that we are still setting up at the moment or, or engage with community, or if we needed to take immediate action on those items, if there was something explicitly stated in there. Thank you, Ryan. I think your question, your your answers, and obviously the answers to the previous questions have really highlighted the vast body of work to implement the protocols, and therefore in, it infers, you know, that really staff across the library would need to be involved in their implementation. So my next question is both to you, Ryan, and to Alicia. Without subject matter expertise, how do you get the team on board with implementation, and in particular? How do non-Indigenous staff work with Indigenous collections? Ryan, might you like to start? And then we'll hand to Alicia. Or if you'd like to start, Alicia. OK, go ahead. <laughs> OK, I, I might give you a break for a little bit. OK, uh, thanks. I think um, we all know that your big aspirations we have here can almost be paralyzing. And we're often afraid of doing the wrong thing. And we're very focused on doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. um, but I think doing nothing is worse. And I think the key here is to make sure we don't feel alone and we do partner where we can. And we need staff to feel comfortable with what they're doing. Making sure that you know library staff know who to contact for support is really part of this, making sure it's well communicated. You need to provide clear instructions. So if they're involved in any of this work, they have clear tasks and procedures to follow and take the burden of the bigger decisions off their shoulders so that they do feel comfortable. We need leaders, obviously, in this space, but we do need followers too. So follow in the footsteps of others. There are so many small accessible steps that everyone can do right now. I mean, investigate where you're purchasing your resource from, you know, add those Auslan codes. There's a codathon coming up really soon in July, and that's going to have lots of support there from other libraries. Um, there are so many examples from other libraries about, you know, sensitivity warnings you could put in place, feedback forms, the access of the thesaurus, for instance, is another one where it's really well established and there's great support for that. You know, find inspiration outside of the library, connect to similar services on campus. Again, networks are just so vital here. Connect to other libraries with similar um, systems to you. So if you're requesting enhancements, you have a bigger voice to ask for change, especially in the metadata field, you know, so you have a bigger voice when you want subject headings to change. Uh, when Ryan was talking more about that collection survey, um, what I do want to mention is the fact that he actually got some staff from other teams involved towards the end of the project. And that was the most valuable experience was seeing how they were encountering these resources. And we were able to give feedback to from our experience in that process as well. And I could, again, you know, multi-skilling opportunities within the library, you know, is a perfect opportunity. You know, engage all your staff and it's so important. Um, to build that confidence. Ryan, what do you want to add to that? Yeah, I'll add to the survey part first as well. And then um, uh, one, of, one of the benefits from the survey and yeah, getting um, everyone involved in that was um, that it sort of gave us a bit more of appreciation around the extent of um, Indigenous knowledges in our collection. And, um, and, and that also started as a bit of a conversation starter around reviewing our processes, particularly with colleagues. Um, um, uh, and 
with with that, like there is now a new change happening, like that. We're sort of reviewing um, uh, our approach to our thesis um, submissions and um, giving people the opportunity to communicate um, about potential sensitivities and um, or if um, they want to include offline codes. And, and we're also looking at doing a remediation work around that too. So. Um, uh, particularly with including offline codes and um, and and IELTS and subject terms to the um, to First Nations content, um, I think what also helped with um, that, particularly with non-Indigenous staff, is is around cultural training and um, and and with our library we have um, great support from the um, um, from our um, DVC Indigenous and um, from our National Centre of Cultural Competence. Um, they provide a module um, co um, cultural competence training and that's mandatory for all staff. So it really started from the top um, with managers like Lisa and Antonia um, um, taking the lead on that um, and, and supporting that with staff as well and encouraging staff to undertake those modules. And, and that gives you that sort of framework around um, um, understanding um, things from Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander perspectives and um, even more broadly taking part in cultural training um, um, is, is definitely um, one way to help with that. Um, I would I would sort of put a caveat on that and that um, that doesn't um, give non-Indigenous staff um, the full um, uh, I guess uh, sort of full knowledge to to make full curatorial decisions on collections, and you still need to have um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander staff to um, assist with that or, or talk with communities, and that's always an important part of collection development, um, particularly with First Nations content, is to go out and talk with communities who are, who are represented in those collections. Um, but it does definitely help around making informed decisions. So if we do come across a, an item that's culturally sensitive, we're not sort of um, shutting everything down and saying this is too hard. Um, we can't. Um, we can't do work on this item because we're not sure where to start on that. Um, it's giving that frame point and going, okay, um, this is, contains ceremonial content. We're not sure about that, but we do know that it might be sensitive because it is talking about um, um, initiation rights. We should go and talk to people out in the community and, and start that engagement. So it's it's more around that informed. Um, doing that informed decision making around that and being able to identify, um, emphasize, emphasize, sorry, and, um, and and then going out and actually having conversations with people and having that sort of viewpoint around that. So um, I think that's sort of the main point around um, uh, particularly how um, non-Indigenous staff can get involved. And, and like Alicia said, um, some of the very small um, um, steps to start off with, like um, some things around, um, um, uh, around training, around cultural care and handling and being able to understand well what is sensitive material and there's a lot of great resources online now like the I should shout out um I had this with the core um cultural learning and um and that's with the um um with the modules around the absolute protocols and then the absolute protocols themselves they provide a good starting point for people um, particularly if you are unsure where to start um being able to understand things like well um what things might be considered culturally sensitive and then that helps with Getting started with identifying those, those items, or at least flagging those items, and then um, and then going out and having conversations with communities about that, and and starting that process. So um, it's definitely important to highlight that as well with um with 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 um, um if you do have knowledge of staff working with those collections. Absolutely, and I think it's important to remember too that cultural competence is a learning journey, and we all continue to learn and. Uh, because we don't all know everything, it's so important to remember to ask questions when you don't know and to reach out to community and the people who do hold that knowledge and the expertise who can provide that advice um, for us how to move to, uh, on how to move forward. And to that point, um, Lisa, before we go to the Q&A, and I can see questions coming in that touch on the next question, um, what part of implementing the protocols are you finding challenging or what are the lessons learned that you could share with us so far? Uh, so you know, libraries are, are generally focused on, we're very good at um, efficiency and providing sort of neutral or unmediated access. Um, and certainly at Sydney, our priority has always been about looking, developing workflows to managing collections at a very large scale. So, you know, it is a challenge for us, both in our current capacity um, and our current approaches to consider the requirements of individual items, to almost slow it down. Um, one of our protocols is related to interpretation of inaccurate and outdated material. 
So specifically, our, our aim is to create opportunities for First Nations community members to publish corrections or differing viewpoints online. So enabling a dialogue between historical material and contemporary communities. Um, what a great goal. But a key challenge with this is technical, where our current systems, and we, you know, we're part of a global ecosystem, they just don't support the concept of, of right of reply or active engagement to provide context or commentary on items in, in our collection. So it's not that we don't want to, but it's just that the capacity to do so is sort of um, not really not there yet. Thank you so much, Lisa, for, sh for sharing those insights and, and to our whole panel. Um, I'd now like to open the floor to questions and I can see some are coming in through the Q&A already. Um, in conversation with colleagues from other libraries, it's become evident that there's so many questions about the practical implementation of our protocols and things like how to get started on a project like this and the challenges to be aware of. So now's a great opportunity to ask any of these types of questions to our expert panel. And I'll begin from the top with a question from Michael Sue. Thank you, Michael. Do you run classes for students on the correct way to use indigenous materials? Um, and I'm, I might just start with that and then throw to the panel. Um, the way that we've chosen to approach this actually um, is rather than to run separate classes that we've made a conscious decision to embed uh, ex examples of indigenous materials and how to cite them and how to work respectfully with them within our existing information literacy classes that we offer through the library um, so that it becomes a part of the way that we educate um, and inform and support our students in digital and information literacy as a whole rather than separately. Um, would any of the other panel members like to add to that? No, I think Antonio put it perfectly. It's just about how we educate, mm -hmm. like how we think about collections, how we manage. It's just embedded. Mm -hmm. It's more powerful and impactful when we do embed it rather than making it separate and a lot more sustainable too. Absolutely. Thanks, Alicia. And so the next question is from Monica. And she has asked, we appreciate the people first ears wide open, listen first approach. Would panel members be free to share examples of some of the initial questions or positioning statements you use to invite and initiate open and respectful conversations? And this might actually go back to our cultural audit. If any of the panel members like, might like to address that. I, I would actually suggest probably Ryan um, would be able to answer this quite well, but from, um, my perspective, um, uh, the way that we've sort of done this is to first sort of acknowledge the work that we've um, either heard others have done or were observed that they've done. So it's part of that. Um, and it also having it as a sharing conversation. So, you know, we've as part of the audit ryan did so much approaching others and it's about you know we we can see that you're doing some work or we've heard you doing some work you know would you be happy to sort of share we're in this same position so and we'd be happy to share what what we learn um i think yeah definitely that's that's definitely a great point lisa and um uh, and it's definitely important to sort of also know um networks around um uh, Australia as well, and, and reaching out to colleagues and and um, and getting their advice, and that's always an important first step. Um, I think as well in terms of um, um, uh, talking with communities as well is is having um, I, I guess it's just being very open and honest um, about um, um, about what we do, and um, and and having that genuine. Um, uh, genuine sort of approach and honest approach to um, to that, um, and I think it's also being, um, I guess, keeping in theme with reconciliation week, being brave, um, but being brave to admit that um, that there might be things that we're unsure about or um, we we may not be doing correctly. And um, I think there was really, um, I guess, to to talk about the um, earlier conference uh, this year, there was a really great statement from someone um, when they said, "Look, sometimes you need to go out to communities and say, look, we've." Um, we've mucked up on this or we haven't done the right thing. And, um, uh, and 
you may you may get um, uh, you you may get negative feedback from people about that. And but if you if you're genuine about wanting to make change and reaching out to people and saying, look, we want to improve our ways of doing here, and um, we want to improve our um, our collections so they are more safer for for people to to engage with. Um, you're going to get people on board for that. Um, I don't know because I do apologise for, for quoting that and not being able to attribute the person for that. Um, uh, but um, it, it's a really important um, approach to that. And I think that that's, um, uh, I guess, not really touching, um, or getting to the straight point on that that, um, that question there. But I guess um, I guess it's sort of more of a general statement around um, around that approach is to being mm -hmm. open and honest about um, about what you're intending to do, um, and following through with, um, with with those as well, and being genuine and, and open and honest. Absolutely, and that's an approach we've taken from the beginning. We we rewind back to the start of this process uh, when we were just embarking on writing the protocols. Actually, from the outset, we decided. Uh, to undertake some initial research by way of a cultural audit to determine what we were doing well in regard to cultural competence in the library and where there was opportunity for improvement. And the research involved, uh, was led by Nathan Sentence, who was the lead author of protocols and involved uh, posing a series of questions to members of the university community, particularly Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander academics, professional staff and students. Um, and we used a yarning methodology where he posed a couple of open-ended questions about, you know, what, what do you feel when you enter library spaces? What do you believe the library is doing well? Um, and where can you see room for improvement? Um, and this was framed around the um, purpose statement that we drafted for the protocols so that there was a common understanding of what we were setting out to achieve, but then asking people for their feedback and how they might like to see cultural co competence better embedded in library practice. So th there's a good example of how we've done that from the very beginning of, of this process. Moving on to a question from Ruth Baxter. I'm very impressed with the openness of the panel members about this journey. journey. Can I ask where there were instances where you've made mistakes or lessons learned? And you, I think, Ryan, you just alluded to um, something there that um, somebody provided feedback on that you could, may, may have done better. Um, are you free to elaborate more on that? Oh, um, again, that was um, a statement. That was more sort of a broad um, uh, statement on that. And that was, I guess, in a, in a previous job a long, long time ago right. um, um, where we... Um, um, we're working with an item and um, that contained um, men's business. Um, this was at another library I worked at. Um, and um, we, with that, we, we worked on the system. We, we did all the, um, um, all the necessary um, things around having a separate section and working on that. And then um, uh, I guess that was sort of when I was first starting off my career and went and talked to someone about that um, who, who didn't identify as male. And um, we were looking at the, the record on... Um, um, on the computer in, in the office and, and a little image of that um, that popped up and we um, did have to go to the community and apologise um, to them for that um, because um, we, we sort of broached broach that protocol and, and sometimes that does happen and even that happens for myself as well. Like um, um, sometimes you do walk into things um, that we may not um, fully be aware or um, um, or sometimes um, you may be forced into that situation there. But um, I guess uh, with, an, with another example, um, uh, on, on that, um, um, sometimes it's um, difficult to have conversations and um, uh, with people. Sometimes it may not be the right time, um, and you do have that conflict between um, uh, deadlines and um, um, and uh, and then having time to, to have conversations um, with, with with people. Um, or sometimes it might be that you um, are, unable, are unable to to talk to the broad range of people so um again uh, in another um in another role i was in um again um we tried to do um uh, enough consultation with communities and we did um miss out on a group and that group approached us and said we weren't consulted um we we apologized and then um heard their statements there as well so um it it's 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 sometimes a bit of a balance there and uh um yeah and and sometimes um like some things are very minor sometimes they are major but um um, I guess I guess that sort of provides a few examples. But like as I said, coming back to to um, owning that and um, and and wanting to make change and, and being able to have open uh, like as one hundred percent open ears and um, and open hearts. I think that's that's the um, important thing at the end there is to to repair that um, um, when you do make those mistakes. Yeah. 
Fantastic. Thanks so much. I'd like to actually give an example if I could, Antonia. Please do, yes. It really talks about um, what a journey this is. So this goes right back to the beginning when we, you know, uh, Nathan um, worked with us to develop the protocols. Um, and it's such a fantastic piece of work. Um, and then we went, okay, we're sort of effectively publishing them by putting in our repository, which, you know, we give to, um, you know, has appropriate uh, metadata and things like that. But, you know, when you get somebody to do work a consultant, it's you own the IP. So right back at the very beginning when we did this, we took the work and put it in our repository and we didn't actually have attribution of Nathan, you know, as, as sort of, uh, the Indigenous author, because we followed this, we followed the standard Western practice. So it's a, for us, it was such a great lesson of how this has to be part of the BAU. You can't sort of just do something in isolation and then hand it on. It actually is, it's the full thing. Um, so that was a really good lesson for us at the beginning, because then it was about um, how did it get embedded in all of our, our processes? this sort of the thinking about how to do this. Thanks, Lisa. And I think we might have time for one more question before we have to wrap up. And this might be another question for you, Lisa, um, from an anonymous attendee. Do you have a recommendation for smaller Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander run publishers to acquire resources from? Actually, that might be a question for um, or Alicia. Alicia, or it actually could be something, can I suggest, this is actually something we might be happy to um, uh, put this on our social media site or just some recommendations or, or send this round. That might be an easier approach. Um, yeah, because it's actually an ongoing thing that we're actively working with um, people like James mm -hmm. Bennett um, or Gobi to identify those smaller mm -hmm. publishers. Precisely, so get in touch with us as well. And just to add to that last one, just what Ryan was talking about, there is no linearity to this. It goes lots of directions, backwards and forwards. And that's the beauty is just accepting that and having patience. But yes, please get in touch if you want to know more about our sources for acquisition. Fantastic. And Lisa, although we don't have time for, to answer more questions, I might just <laughs> add the comment that Michael Consales loves your wallpaper and maybe you could send a description of what the significance is. Mm -hmm. it, it's actually um, a piece of artwork that's part of the sort of the Sydney environment. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. So as we draw this session to a close, I'd like to thank everyone who by attending this session has signaled the importance of reconciliation and interest in the work that we're doing. I'd also like to extend my special thanks, of course, to our panelists, Lisa, Ryan and Alicia, as well as to my colleagues, Jordan and Elisabetta, who've provided tech support for today. In the next few days, the recording of the session will be made available via the library's YouTube channel and we'll send out a link to all the attendees. So thanks again for joining us. And we really look forward to learning more from colleagues across the sector about work you're doing to improve culturally competent library practice. I think it's really important to keep this conversation going and that we all learn from each other. Thanks again, everybody for attending and goodbye and hope to hear from you soon.